wherever you're, you're joining us from today, it is great to be together this morning. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Miranda Stout, and I get the privilege of serving um, at Journey as the worship coordinator, and I'm really excited to be here this morning sharing the message that I feel like God has laid on my heart. Now, for those of you who do know me, if you have seen me walking around, just seen me around, um, you may have noticed there are some things changing about me. And I just want to reassure you, I'm not just eating too much Culver's or Taco Bell or drinking too many milkshakes, but I am pregnant. So we are pregnant with our, oh yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we are pregnant with our second. You may have seen our, our little two-year-old daughter, Mila, running around here before if you're here in the building. Really excited to see what two kids um, of our own in this world is like. So I'm sure I'll be asking for advice from a lot of you. <laughs> so thanks in advance for that. But, you know, since um, being pregnant with our first, I really have gained an interest in pregnancy and labor and delivery and just all the things that it brings, right? We know every woman is different, so we all have our food aversions and, and our cravings, and I'm an avid coffee drinker. I love my morning coffee and my afternoon coffee, and unfortunately, this time around, I could not stomach a cup of coffee at all this first trimester, which was extremely heartbreaking for me. But, but now that we're a little bit, you know, moving along, we're, we're back at it, so I'm excited that I get to drink my coffee again. <laughs> um, so those of you who have, have, have given birth or have kids, you probably can relate to me a little bit in that. But, you know, I, I did a lot of research, and I watched videos and TV shows on, on pregnancy and things like that. Um, and it's just really amazing to me what the human body can do. And I think the thing that gets me the most is the whole giving birth aspect of, of pregnancy. The very last time when the, when the baby comes into this world, um, it's something that is difficult. It's something that is painful. It's excruciating. Um, and I wouldn't recommend doing this, but I, right before I gave birth to my first, I would look at like diagrams and we'll just call it like the journey that the baby goes on in birth. And I just remember thinking, how in the world is this supposed to happen? Like, this just seems completely impossible. But I knew that there was something in me that could get the job done. There was some power within me um, that just knew what to do. I, I knew that God created me to do this. And so, of course, um, I did it. <laughs> so even if you haven't given birth before or don't have kids, you can't relate, but maybe there is something that you have done in your life that has felt completely impossible, but you just found the power within you to do it. Maybe you're an athlete and you scored a goal that should not have gone in. It should not have been successful, but it was. Maybe you were the underdog um, versing a really good team, not expected to win, and you won. Maybe you're, you're a musician and you hit a really high note and just surprised yourself. Maybe you drove really far away from home and made it back without using GPS or maps. <laughs> what have you done in your life that has felt impossible that you just, you just surprised yourself? You, you, just, you just made it happen. All this talk of the impossible really reminds me of the power of God at work in us. This power we know as followers of Jesus we have access to because his word says so. In fact, it actually lives inside of us. God's word says that the same power that conquered the grave, the same power that beat death, that raised Jesus from the dead, actually lives inside of us as his followers. And that is a powerful truth to remember and a powerful truth to live out. And so we're going to look today at a couple different ways that we can access and we can create space for the power of God to work in our lives. And I think the tension in this, in this world that we live in today, is that when we face impossible situations, we tend to utilize our own human power and our own human strength to gain some sort of success or to get the job done. I know in my own life, a big part of my story was insecurities. 
Looking back on that, I think the root of those insecurities of never feeling good enough, never being a good enough wife or sister or daughter or friend, coworker, employee, whatever it was, the root of all of that was actually pride. So I was trying to do life my own way. I was trying to get affirmation from people who it wasn't really their job to give me affirmation. I would rely on people like my husband or other prominent people around me. And when they fell short, just like humans do, I fell apart. So I really wasn't relying on the power of God, on his promises. I wasn't relying on his truths, on who he says that I am. And it wasn't until I started doing that that I really gained a lot of freedom. Not only do we tend to rely on our our own human selves when facing impossible situations, but maybe we have had an experience in the past of an impossible situation that didn't go the way that we wanted it to. It didn't go the way that we hoped for or prayed for or believed for. And we were left feeling empty. We were left shocked. We were left lacking in trust to God, like, like, what are you doing? Just questioning him and his plan for our life. So now when we face impossible situations, we tend to just give up. We don't really believe for it or hope for it or pray for it. We just give up. What we know for sure is that God, when we surrender our own human strength and our own human power, that also includes surrendering our plans for our life to God's plans and to his power in our lives. So, so once again, we're going to look at today, how do we actually do that? If you want to take a, a look at your Bibles and turn to Daniel 4, we are going to read about a guy named King Nebuchadnezzar. And and King Nebuchadnezzar was known as the most powerful king of the Babylonian Empire. He was faced with this incredible challenge and almost impossible situation of leading an entire empire. And King Nebuchadnezzar was probably the definition of someone who utilized their own human self-motivated power to get the job done. He was arrogant. He was rude. He actually thought of himself as an equal to God. And so he thought that he deserved to be, to be worshipped. And so that's really what he required of his people. His thing was that he, he equated wisdom with power. And so he would gather together all of the most intelligent people of his, of his kingdom and utilize them for various things. So what happens is King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and it's kind of a confusing dream. Um, So he needs to hire an interpreter to come in and and tell him what this dream is about. This interpreter is Daniel. And um, so so he he has this dream, and like I said, it's very confusing. But I think the gist of it is that this is a warning from God saying, okay, King Nebuchadnezzar, if you continue to lead how you're leading and do what you're doing, there are going to be some pretty difficult and uncomfortable things that are going to happen to you. So let's take a look at at what Daniel says about this dream in verse 25. This is his interpretation. says this, You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wills. He wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots, which was part of his dream, means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. So I love how how Daniel kind of gives this second warning, like, okay, Take my advice here. Stop doing what you're doing or else these things are going to happen to you. He makes it really clear. So let's see what happens in verse 33. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the, t- at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. 
all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases. With the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth, no one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I love that it says he became even greater than before. Because he chose to surrender his own power, his own ways to God's ways and to God's power, he became even greater than before. He actually bowed down in worship and recognized that God is the true King of kings and Lord of lords. And I also think that King Nebuchadnezzar realized that he was able to best be utilized in the position that he was in if he surrendered his own power to God's power. And I also, I just want to make something clear too. We don't just want to utilize the power of God in our lives just to help us get through tough situations or for our own selfish gain, but we want to utilize the power of God to move his kingdom forward, to bring hope and to bring healing to those people in our lives. Also, if you were here last week, Pastor John talked about the fact that we can utilize the power of God to become more like Jesus every day, and that's really the goal. So now I know that none of us here are looking to take over empires and kingdoms and become kings and queens. And if you are, I'd love to talk about it afterwards. (laughs) It's interesting to me. Um, But I do know that we face real impossible situations in our lives every day. And if you take a look at your life right now, what impossible situation are you facing? Maybe it's a, a marriage crisis or a relationship crisis. Maybe it's a parent-child dynamic that you, you, you just don't know what's gonna happen. I haven't been a parent for very long, but I already know I cannot do it using my own strength and my own power. Maybe you're a student and um, you're just really struggling in school, whether it's friends or academics or extracurricular activities, whatever it may be, and you don't know how to make it through another day. Maybe it's a medical diagnosis, a struggle with infertility. What is the situation in your life that feels impossible, that maybe you're trying to control by yourself? Maybe you're trying to utilize your own power and strength instead of surrendering to God. So how do we actually do this, right? How do we actually apply these things to our own lives? We're going to talk about just a few different things in different ways on how to create space for the power of God to work in our lives. I know that with impossible situations come a lot of feelings, right? Those feelings are feelings of sadness, um, maybe anger, shame, maybe even some rage, maybe anxiety, maybe even something as, as difficult as depression comes up. There's a lot of feelings when we face impossible situations. The thing is, feelings are good, right? Feelings can, can help us process things. Um, feelings are good. They can give us warning signs and um, really help us figure out maybe what the next step is. But when we rely on our own feelings, that's where the problem becomes, co- comes in because feelings are chaotic, right? They can create this sense of chaos in our head. They go up and down. They just blow with the wind. They're not steady. And so I, what I would encourage today is to feel all of your feelings, but trust all of his promises. God gives us so many promises in his word that we can fully rely on, that we can use as our rock, especially in times where where we don't know what to do next. And so I just picked out a few promises that, um, that God talks about in his word. I mean, there are hundreds of promises in the Bible. And so if you ever just want a list of promises, just Google 
promises of God. And, and there will be a list of hundreds of, of promises, hundreds of truths and encouragements that he gives to us. So there's going to be some promises that will come up on the screen. Um, these are just a few that I, that I picked out. The first one, he promises to work everything out for your good. That comes from Romans 8, 28. No matter what the situation is, no matter how bad the situation is, he is working it out for your good, even if it doesn't feel like it. He promises to give us strength. He promises to never leave us. He promises his counsel to us. I don't know how many times I've wished that I could just, uh, just talk to someone and someone would just give me the answer. The Holy Spirit does that for us. He guides and directs every step we take and every thought that we have. And then this last one, his power is made perfect in our weakness. There's no pressure to be perfect. There's no pressure to do things perfectly or handle situations perfectly. There's no pressure because his power is always working through us. And it's made perfect in our weakness. And I think an example of someone who, who follows the promises of God so well is Jesus. Right, Jesus' whole life here on earth was filled with him constantly surrendering his own human power and his own human strength to God. I mean, he performed miracles. He healed people. He raised the dead. He broke chains, like years and years of chains of, of sin and of shame and of addiction. He brought a lot of hope to these people because he surrendered his own power to the power of God. And I think that one of the most powerful things that Jesus ever did in his life here on earth was his death on the cross. He sacrificed himself not just for the people who love him or the people who were in his corner or on his team, but he sacrificed himself for the people who hated his guts. He sacrificed himself for his, his best friends who actually gave him up the day that he was, he was crucified. But not only that, he sacrificed himself for the people who hate him even now. And the only possible way that he could have done that is if, is if it was rooted in love, is if his, his sacrifice was fully and completely rooted in love. Because Jesus loved people in a way that was completely unconditional, he created space for the power of God to work in people's lives forever, for eternity, because of his decision. So I believe that unconditional love makes space for the power of God to work. And there's a couple things that happen when we begin to love people unconditionally. Relationships are started, which means that, that we get the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, encouraging people, praying for people, believing for people, being able to care for them in ways that we never have before. Also, maybe there's someone in your life that you can think of even right now who for some reason has been labeled unlovable. Maybe there's someone who comes to mind. Maybe it's at work or at school. Maybe they've been labeled dirty or gross or non-approachable, or unlovable. When we love those people because we are called to love them, because they are, are made, we're all made in the image of God, it, it creates this exponential effect. They begin to love people who begin to love people who begin to love people. And then there is this just amazing process of God's power working in people's lives through unconditional love. When we love unconditionally, relationships are created, we get to love the unlovable, and the Holy Spirit gets to work through us, allowing the power of God to work through us in ways that we, we never even could have imagined. I love what Paul says. If you want to turn to Ephesians 3, we're going to start in, in verse 16. And this is a, um, this is a prayer that, that Paul is, is writing to to this church, starting in verse 16. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Loving unconditionally is a powerful testament to God's love to us and gives space for the Holy Spirit to work through us and the power of God to work in us. And I know that with, with all things come barriers, right? We know that there is an enemy out there who wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. He doesn't want us to succeed in our lives. And I think one of the things that he wants most is for us to think that we don't actually need the power of God in our lives. And so far, I've been talking to a camp of people who are in an impossible situation right now and need God's power to work, like, today. Like, they need, they, they need him to do something right now. But I think there's another camp of people. Maybe if, if you're honest with yourself, your life is going really well. Everything's great. Relationships are great. Finances are great. School is great. Work is great. There's this kind of sort of contentment that you're in. And I just want to say praise God for that. That, that's incredible that you are in that position. I just want to remind you that it's actually God's power that got you there in the first place. And he doesn't want to stop working in your life. And so I'd encourage you, if you find yourself in this place of kind of like a spiritual contentment, begin to pray for more and believe for more and hope for more for your life because God does not want to stop working. He wants to continue to push his kingdom forward. There's always more redemption to be had, always more hope to be had and healing. There's always more to surrender. And and there's really more life to be had, more full life to be had through him. And I'd also encourage you, if you find yourself in in that spot today, that maybe it's time to ask yourself, who in my life is facing an impossible situation that needs me to call up the power of God in them. Because if we go back to what we talked about in the beginning, when a woman is in labor, right, when she is in the thick of it, it's the most excruciating, excruciating time, and she says, I can't do it anymore. I don't think I can do this. It's the people in the room. It's it's her friends and her family and the nurses and the doctors who are calling out the power within her to get the job done. We know that there are people facing real impossible situations, and when they feel like they can't do it anymore, that there's no more belief in them, there's no more hope, there's no more faith, it's our job to let them borrow some of our faith. It's our job to call out the power of God within them. Because we get the chance to do this life together. And as we allow God's power to work through us, we can begin to call out his power in other people. A couple of uh, weeks ago, my husband and I went on a trip to Boston, and it was kind of a, a late anniversary trip. And um, if you've ever been to a big city, you've maybe had um, access or, or experienced different Uber drivers all over the city, right? So we, we experienced a lot of different personalities. So you get the Uber driver who, who will talk your ear off and wants to know about your entire life story. And then there's also the Uber driver who just wants to get you to your destination without saying a word. So we experienced both of those, but we did meet a guy And um, we found out he was from Haiti, and um, we immediately had a connection to him. Both my husband had been on missions trips to Haiti, and so um, we we had this connection and started talking about um, his life in Haiti and what we did in Haiti, and um, it was a really, really good conversation. He he talked about his life in the orphanage and um, how he really feels like God brought him out of that situation, and he's happy to be in the States creating a life for himself, and it, it was great. And then all of a sudden, we started talking about something called voodoo, 
If you don't know what voodoo is, it's, it's a religion that they practice in Haiti and I'm sure other countries as well. It's, it's very evil. It's very demonic. They do um, some pretty awful things in the name of voodoo. And we started talking about this voodoo. And you could just feel the whole vibe of the car just completely change. Like, I almost didn't want to even look him in the eye. I was, like, ready to, to get out of the car. And what he said to us was very surprising. He said, I want to tell you guys something. The voodoo power is good. People just don't know how to use it for good. Luckily, at that time, we were at our destination, so we were able to leave. But I just really felt God say very clearly to me, see, people want my power, even if they don't know that it's my power that they want. It's impossible for the power of God to be evil, right? It's only used for good. It's only used for the good of others and to, and to push his kingdom forward. But it made me think about, you know, even if we're not practicing voodoo, what are we replacing the power of God with in our lives? What other power are we replacing it? It's our own human power. I'm sure there's other, other religions all over the world that, that are, are similar to that. But, but people want the power of God. They long for this supernatural power to come and, and do a work in their lives. And it's really up to us as followers of, of Jesus to share our story to share how the power of God has worked in our lives and give all of the glory to God in the meantime. So the team is going to come now, and um, they're going to lead us in a song called Do It Again. And this song is really a powerful um, declaration of just truths, that we have seen God be a miracle worker before. We have seen him bring hope and healing and do incredible things before, and we're going to see him do it again. And we're just going to declare that over ourselves and over, over our lives today. And I would encourage you, this time, this response time is really for you. So if you want to sit, you can stay seated. If you want to stand and allow your, your physical posture to lead your heart posture and just continue to surrender your own power to God's power, do that. Maybe you are in those two camps that I talked about. Maybe you're facing an impossible situation. You need the power of God to work in your lives. And maybe you ask yourself, where do you need to believe and declare God's promises in your life? And maybe you're in the other camp of people who you're in this sort of phase of, of contentment. You don't really feel like you need, you need God if you're being really honest with yourself. First, I'd encourage you to have a conversation with him and see what he says. And then I'd encourage you to ask yourself, as part of expression, expressing unconditional love to others, where do you need to believe and declare God's promises in someone else's life? And I'd encourage you, maybe that person is here in the room today. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a friend that you brought or a family member. Go have that conversation with them right now. This is your chance to call out the power of God within them, to share your faith, to, to let them borrow your faith and belief and hope in their lives. Remember, we're doing this thing all together as a community. So this time is yours. Let's give the Holy Spirit a chance to work today.